Good morning and welcome to the very first Science Superstars, which is a coming together of 142 schools and 4,000 students from across the country who were all dialing in online this morning to hear about careers in conservation. So my name is Michelle Stook. I'm from Bush Heritage Australia and today I'm going to be your host. So my usual job with Bush Heritage is the Seeding the Future Program Lead, which is a program that we've developed to support young people into conservation careers. I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of this first ever online event and I'm joining you today on Yagara and Terrible Country here on the Brisbane River. And I'd like to extend and acknowledge the traditional owners, the Yagara and Terrible people, and, and acknowledge them for their past, present and emerging leaders and extend a massive welcome to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander folks joining us from around the country this morning. So why are we here and who are Bush Heritage? So I bet at this stage of your school career, if you had a dollar for every time somebody had asked you, what are you gonna do when you leave school? You'd probably be quite wealthy by now. But we believe a better question to ask is, what problems do you want to solve and how do you wanna feel every day whilst you're solving them? So many of you may have heard the term green jobs. And green jobs are something that are developing in science, conservation and the sustainability space in an effort to mitigate and manage climate change. So most recently, I was reading some research from LinkedIn that they've released stating that green jobs have increased on average 8% year on year over the last five years. And these statistics are only going to get better and larger. So what that means for you is it's actually a really exciting time to be thinking about what you wanna do and looking at careers in conservation and the environmental sector. So who are Bush Heritage? We are a national not-for-profit conservation organisation and we protect ecosystems and wildlife across Australia. So how do we do this? We purchase land and we work across the nation with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander partners and agricultural partners. So we're working together using right way knowledge and science to bring the bush back to good health. So today we own and manage 1.2 million hectares of land across Australia and um, through our partnerships with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and our agricultural partners, we manage many, many millions more. So that means we get to protect threatened ecosystems and 7,716 species of plants and animals including at least 243 that are endangered. But we need more people to do this work. So we've been very, very lucky in our organisation. Late last year, we benefited from um, a generous support of the Vincent Fairfax Family Foundation, who were equally passionate about getting young people into green careers. And they've helped us set up this Seeding the Future program what we offer are paid internships, paid traineeships, student placement opportunities, and also opportunities for young PhD researchers to help us answer the knowledge gaps that we have in our organisation. So helping to solve those problems and answer questions. But today we're going to meet four presenters who predominantly are ecologists and have developed careers in the environmental sector that way. But I wanted to share with you that our organization and many others like us need other kinds of uh, employees as well. So we need project managers, we need accountants, we need graphic designers, movie makers, we need marketing and communication specialists. And we also need social workers like me, just to make sure that everybody in our organization is thriving. So, as mentioned, we'll be talking with four presenters this morning and they're going to give you a really good indication of what it means to work in our sector and also the twists and turns and the pathways that have led them there. Now, before we meet our first presenter, just a little bit of housekeeping. So we, like you, are joining from all over the country and some of us are in quite remote locations. So the internet can be 
dodgy at times. So if this happens, please be patient. There may be a sh little bit of a lag or we may drop out. We will come back online. So please just bear with us. The format of this morning, we'll meet our first two presenters and then we'll break for just a short 10 minute discussion break. And what we hope you'll do is just to chat in your own groups and we're using the Zoom platform. So please put any questions you'd like our presenters to answer in the Zoom chat. And at the end of that 10 minutes, we'll come back and meet our final two presenters. Again, that'll be followed by a short 10 minute question time. And then we'll finish our presentation this morning with a full 20 minutes of Q&A so that we can get through as many of your questions as possible. So I reckon that might be enough from me this morning. So let's meet our first presenter. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Vanessa Westcott. So Vanessa has been with Bush Heritage for nine years and she's held various roles. So Vanessa was our regional ecologist in Western Australia before she moved over to New South Wales where she's our uh, senior ecologist. So the pathway that Vanessa took to become an ecologist was completing a Bachelor of Arts and Science with honours in ecology. And then she went and did a PhD in plant and fire ecology. So thank you and over to you, Ness. Thanks everyone. Hi there. Um, I would like to first of all acknowledge the traditional owners of the Orange area in New South Wales where I live for the Wiradjuri people. Uh, <clears throat> I grew up on the banks of the Billabong Creek near also on Wiradjuri country and southern New South Wales and those the times in the dinghy and the treehouse and with the kangaroos and the big river red gums really did instill a love of nature in me from a very young age uh, and but still when I was at school I didn't quite know what I wanted to do I had a really good biology teacher um, and I knew I loved animals, but really one thing that helped me was I had an opportunity to go to Melbourne Uni in, and stay a couple of nights uh, on campus. And I loved that. And I knew that's the place I wanted to go. So I had that uh, clear. And so then I finished school and I did, I went to Melbourne Uni and I lived on campus and it was wonderful. I really felt like I fitted in and yeah, I just recommend trying new things and participating if you do go to uni, join clubs. And for me, I tried a lot of different subjects because I still wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I recommend picking the field subject so you get out on the ground and see what that type of thing's like and whether it's something you're interested in. And I did, yeah, as Michelle said, a Bachelor of Arts and Sciences, and I majored it in Botany and Geography. And I did an extra year, an honours year, uh, looking into ecology, and I did some German as well, but I just loved university. And when I finished that, I'd lined up through my honours work, some volunteer work in New Zealand, and I got to look for giant carnivorous endangered snails and lots of other things. Uh, and it was really fantastic experience for me. Uh, and then I came back, I did a bit more travel, I came back and I started my PhD and a PhD is a really great way to become a bit of a specialist or expert in one thing and really sink your teeth into it and ask those big questions and dig deep and uh, <clears throat> it's hard, it was, it, it was long and you, you don't have much money like it took me four years to do. Um, but you build connections and you attend conferences and hear talks from people that you, you know, just blows your mind, opens up your world and it opens up doors as well in your career, having the PhD um, later on. And my focus was on fire ecology. Uh, I studied this amazing shrubland community in Western Australia for the Eniyama shrublands. And it's one of the most diverse places in the world for plants. So more plants living together than in any other place, pretty much. Uh, and it was just spending so much time there. I got to love any other and those beautiful shrubs. Uh, and there's a picture of it. It doesn't look too exciting, but wow, when you start understanding how incredible it is, it, it really is a special place. And it's re really adapted to fire. So I looked at, I measured all the plants before, and then we did some burning and came back and looked at them afterwards and um, see how they responded to different types of fire. 
Uh, <clears throat> along the way, <clears throat> excuse me, in my PhD, I did some little jobs. I tried different things. I drove a bunch of uni students around Fraser Island for a field subject. And I worked for a mining company in the Pilbara in Western Australia. I did little jobs. And one of the special things I did was some volunteer work in the Northern Territory. I was reading up about fire and I read this paper about fire in, in the tropical savannas. And I thought, wow, I'd love to learn more. And I emailed the author and I said, uh, you know, uh, I would love to come and work with you or learn from you. Would that be possible? And he wrote straight back and he said, no, I'm busy. Try me in a month. And I was a bit intimidated, but I waited 30 days and I emailed him back and he said, okay, up you come. And I spent a month up there and it was just amazing. So you never know what, what might, what opportunities might, um, you know, happen. So, and then when I finished my PhD, I, as I was getting to the end of it, I lined up some amazing work. It was through the University of Sheffield and it was a climate change project. And they were monitoring these tiny little annual plants that complete their life cycle in one year. And they live on the dunes along the coast from Portugal, Spain, France, and England. And I got to go along and help monitor these little tiny plants and meet amazing people and make friends. And that was fantastic. And then I did a bit more travel and I came home. I thought, right, I've got to get a real job now. And I started to work at Biosis, which is a consulting company as a botanist. And it was a real foot in the door for me. I got to travel all over Victoria and I learned a lot. I learned about the real world, about you know, native vegetation clearance and how some people want to get around the rules and do the wrong thing. I learned all those real life things that happen out there. Uh, but it was, oh yeah, and, and you know, I learned a lot about threatened grasslands around Melbourne and looked for threatened plants and went to Uluru and rainforest. It was absolutely, uh, you know, really diverse opportunities there. But it was when I applied for a job at Bush Heritage as an ecologist that I thought, well, that, I think this is really what I would love to do. And 75 people applied and somehow they picked me. I can't really believe it. Um, but it, um, I, all I can say is I was proactive and I rang up and I said, I'm keen and asked a few questions and I would recommend doing that if you really want the job. Uh, can't hurt, I don't think. Uh, yeah, but Bush Heritage, I just felt like I belonged there. I felt like I believed in what they were doing, which, which is to look after the bush, you know, cause, and um, it's very practical. So Bush Heritage owns these properties, these reserves, and, you know, they're real pieces of country that need to be looked after. So you're dealing with real problems. And that appealed to me. And I had to learn, because I had a bit of a plant background, I had to learn about the animals, because ecologists, you have to have that real breadth of, of knowledge. And yeah, I started in Western Australia and now I'm based in New South Wales. But I'd say, you know, as an ecologist, one of your main jobs is to, you know, monitor the bush, make sure it's going okay, encourage researchers to come and help you. Um, but there's such a variety of other things you do. Like I did a moth survey and I didn't know anything much about moths and it blew my mind. They are amazing, amazing little things or big things. Um, and I uh, learned, you know, all sorts of other things. That little photo down the bottom is of a planigale, a tiny little Australian native mammal that we trapped. Um, and they live in the cracking clays. I mean, amazing things that I've learned. And I got to talk to a lot of people and present at big conferences and to people out in the bush talking about why it's special. And uh, that's all, that's been really uh, wonderful. And yeah, I've met great people and I've done lots of field work, but also, you know, brought that back to, um, my desk to sort of under, you know, analyze that information to sort of understand how the bush was going and what we could do better to look after it. One thing I did want to talk about was the Birriliburu Indigenous Protected Area. So when I was in Western Australia for five years, I worked with Maru, and that's they're the traditional owners of Birriliburu, which is a 6.6 .6 million hectare bit of bush, a bit of country big bit of country out in the desert in Western Australia. And they have a ranger program where they're out on country looking after their country. And I was able to, well, Bush Heritage has a partnership with them. So we support that ranger program and work together. And so I was able to go out with them onto their country and learn from them and support what they were doing. And it was just absolutely incredible for me and life-changing. Um, it changed how, yeah, I think what ecology means and, yeah, it was just really, really powerful. And I, this is a picture of me driving along and I've got five or six 
ranger ladies in the car with me and we've got the slim dusty going and we're eating snacks and and then someone will say stop the car Ness and it'll be some animal tracks they've seen that they want to go look at or bush tucker that they've found and it was just absolutely incredible to work with them and this is Rita she's an elder um, and she was born on country, um, really, really connected, really strong culture, cultural knowledge and understanding of the country and of her country and really passionate. And we just clicked and we were able to have a giggle and she loved plants too. And it was just so, so powerful to work with her. And one thing we did particularly was work on bush tucker. So all the rangers helped to collate all their bush tucker knowledge and we recorded them talking in language and press specimens and that's me eating my first wonky witchetty grub which was totally delicious um this is my favorite bush tucker on really very country this is the yilka lily and you you the little um crystally bits of sugar that an insect has left on the branches of the mulga tree and you get your mouth on it and just sort of crunch them off and it is sweet and absolutely delicious uh the other thing that stuck out was Birliburu is important country for bilbies. So bilbies are quite um, threatened and where they're left in the wild is largely, that map shows you down the bottom where that, uh, the red area is all land. That's where bilbies are left and it's the red area is land that is either owned or, and managed. It's owned and managed by Aboriginal people. So they're very important to looking after the bilby. But what what I learned was they're also super knowledgeable about the bilby. So there's a picture there of a scat of a baby scat and a mum scat. So we know there's breeding on country. They were able to, they just have so knowledgeable about where to find them and um, what their burrows look like. And when you find fresh slime of bilby with the rangers, you just throw your hands in the air because it feels wonderful to know that they're still there and that the ranger work is actually helping to look after them. Very, very important. And so, yeah, that taught me a lot about right way science and the right way science approach, which Bush Heritage supports and um, actively uh, tries to undertake across the country. And it's about acknowledging their knowledge and respecting it and listening and learning. And this is a picture of Rita's back because I spent so much time walking through the bush. She walks quite fast and she'd point things out to me and I'd try to learn along the way. And um, But it's about, well, you know, just working together and finding projects to work on where everybody's really keen and passionate and the benefits are obvious for looking after country for conservation but also for people uh, and i'm actually going to take this is so important to me i'm going to take six months off and um, work for bush heritage and work for the federal government in this sort of indigenous engagement in conservation space because i think it's really important so a couple of last slides I don't want you to think it's all fun and games. There's flies and ticks and hot and cold and rain and you might not earn a huge amount of money and you'll find lots of feral animals, which, you know, on an individual level might be quite cute, but at a population scale, the, the devastation they cause to our native plants and our native animals is really upsetting. And, and it's very, there's no, they're tricky problems. There's no easy answer. Same with weeds, like that's a picture of buffalo grass, which is just horrible stuff. Um, and sometimes the other thing I'd say is you go for a road trip with your family and you can't take the goggles off. So you, you sort of learn to see the bush and read the bush and you see the erosion or the weeds or the, and you sometimes wish you could just enjoy your road trip, but you learn to read the bush differently as an ecologist. Uh, and sometimes things can get you down and it can feel overwhelming and there's just so much to do, but then you've got to remember all the wonderful parts about being in a conservation, having a career in conservation, like the people that you meet and the places you get to go. And, you know, sometimes it's just the little things when you stop, like burrowing bees or trapdoor spiders or uh, kangaroo faces, or even the little tiny seedlings that come up after a fire that have been waiting for that fire to emerge. Uh, and there's just, as I said before, there's such a big variety of uh, things to do. Um, it's meaningful and rewarding work. You're part of a movement, you're part of a group of people around the world trying to look out for the bush and you just so many opportunities to learn and, and grow. Uh, yeah, and I just wanted to finish, you know, you can make a difference in, cons in a career in conservation, you can. And sometimes you will see it. So that's a picture of um, the property where I grew up um, on the banks of the Billabong Creek and underneath 
that you can, there's all these native grasses that have come up underneath the gum trees that we let grow. We helped them establish. They were tiny little seedlings. They grew up and then the native grass came back. So that's an impact or a difference you can see on the ground and, and we see those on our reserves. But sometimes you might see the difference that you've made. Like you might talk to a farmer who goes back to their farm and changes the way they do some land management that has a good outcome for the bush. Or you might inspire a young person to have a career in conservation and who knows what amazing things they might do in their career. So um, you can make a difference and I think that's really important to remember. And I'll just leave with this slide, which is of a pebble dragon, if you can find it. Thank you. Got it. Saw it straight up, Ness. So thank you for that. I hope everyone else was able to find it on the screen. And, and I think what you showed us all is we never get bored in our careers mm -hmm. doing this mm -hmm. sort of work. So yeah, it can be hard at times, but you'll never get bored. So thank you so very much. And please, if you've got any questions for Vanessa, um, start to get them in the chat now. We're monitoring the chat. I can see that there's a few things uh, starting to come through. Now we're just waiting for our next presenter, Verity. So uh, she's not too far, as mentioned at the beginning of our presentation. Um, you know, we're, we're from all over the country the internet might drop out and what have you so uh, we'll just give Verity another moment or so but while we're just getting her on uh, line I'll just tell you a little bit about her so Verity was one of our very first Seeding the Future interns so she started uh, doing her internship late last year with us so I got the opportunity to meet her when I was over in Western Australia and um, she just lights up when she's talking about the work that she does. So it was a wonderful opportunity to meet her. And after she finished her internship, she then got the opportunity to, uh, while well, one of our other staff members was going on some parental leave, she took on the acting role as regional ecologist. So Verity is in the very early stages of her science career. And her pathway, she completed a Bachelor of Science majoring in biology and psychology at the Australian uh, National University down in Canberra. And she's also most recently completed her honours in conservation at the University of Western Australia. So Verity, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the intro. So Yes, as Michelle said, um, I'm still very early stages, um, but I wanted to start before I started talking about myself by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land in which I'm presenting. So the Wajak Nyungar people of the Nyungar Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So I, as Michelle said, have just started a role as the regional ecologist over here in Western Australia's Midwest. Um, and my role focuses, as Ness was saying, a lot on monitoring and research to help better manage our reserves and improve the health of the country. And it means that I get to spend a bunch of my time out on the reserve, seeing the beautiful landscapes and, and getting to, to see and understand and interact with the plants and animals. Um, and then the other part of my time banging my head against the wall trying to understand the data because I'm still quite new to this and it is a massive learning experience but it is a massive pleasure as well but I am very new and my journey up until this point has been a bit of a rambling one um, and maybe it might resonate with some of you guys you can take either some solace or some tips however you see <laughs> fit so the early days um a lot like Let Ness, um, I love being outside. My parents would take my siblings and I camping and I grew up in Canberra on Ngunnawal country. And um, my siblings and I, we would go out to the nature reserves and build cubbies and, you know, throw rocks at each other and whatever kid stuff we did. And it was fantastic. Um, and it's sort of, a, it, as with Ness, instilled a love of nature for me. And then and I went to school, not that interesting to you guys, but as I was leaving college, it was time to start making decisions about the next steps. And for me, I was good at learning. I enjoyed it and I didn't know what else I was going to do. So uni felt like the next step. Um, during college, I'd really enjoyed psychology, but I'd also done surprisingly well at biology. So not being able to decide between them, I applied to do both at the ANU and gratefully I was accepted. But at the end of year 12, um, I was 
burnt out and I just wanted to turn my brain off and go traveling. So I took a gap year. And then when I came back, I packed my bag and went to my first ever biology lecture at ANU. And it was there that I first heard the term ecology. We were being given this presentation and the presenter was telling us that there was this field of biology where you could go outside and like really get into the dirt and understand the interactions between all the different organisms there and how they all fit together. And I was like, this is like a real life David Attenborough documentary. I was so hooked so quickly. And as my university career went on, my interest in psychology sort of dwindled, but ecology was this dark horse that was charging forward. Um, it wasn't just that the content was super interesting and it was, but I also loved the adventure of it. Ecology took me to so many places that I wouldn't have been able to go without it. I got a chance to visit the Great Barrier Reef and I saw sea turtles laying their eggs and um, I got to go to the Malaysian jungles and had monkeys wake me up. Um, I dug big holes and made mud balls and drank wine and set fire to a bunch of sticks in a wind tunnel and it was all in the name of science. And um, as I continued on this journey throughout uni, I was sort of just choosing the classes that seemed interesting or exciting or fun. And as I did that, I sort of realized that this was the path that I wanted to be on. I realized that this beautiful natural world has given me so much joy and peace. And it was, it's so under threat. I started to feel this really deep need to protect it. And so um, I started taking more courses in conservation. I sort of realized that this was a bit of a, a trajectory. And um, so yeah, so I started taking taking a bit more of a directed approach to my studies and I started thinking about what sort of roles afterwards um, that I might be able to do, which would combine this love of being outside and this need to protect what I cared for. Um, and uni finished and I'd like to say that this new direction of um, led this new direction that I'd found sent me straight down this trajectory of selfless environmentalism but it didn't. I was really tired. I was burnt out. And so all I wanted to do was turn my brain off and go traveling. But at that point in time, COVID hit. So after moping around for, you know, a couple of months, I was like, okay, well, I need to start thinking about something else. And a friend of a friend let me know that the Department of Environment in Canberra was hiring. And this was actually an unexpected blessing. The work was as an environmental assessor. So it was office based, so not my dream position, but it was in the field of environment. And it taught me so much. I think the value of working cannot be underestimated. You learn how to function in the world. You learn how to operate. You learn how to behave you know, in a, in a professional environment, you learn how to behave in meetings, you learn how to write emails to people you don't know, you learn how to do things in the daytime and not finish everything at 3am, which was previously how I operated. And these are all like really, really useful life skills. And it was also during this time that I first had interactions with ecologists. So as an environmental assessor, I was reading their reports and we also got the opportunity to go out on site visits, which is what some of these pictures are from. And I was just so impressed by their breadth of knowledge, how connected they were to the environment. They would show us these patches of land and be able to name all the species by their scientific name. And they could tell us exactly how these frogs used this patch of swamp and the cogs in my brain started turning. I was thinking, well, this might be the role for me. I get to go outside and, and learn about this beautiful environment and then hopefully protect it. And so that was a little bit of a light bulb moment, but I finished my year contract with the department and I was bored of living in Canberra, bored of working in an office and wanted a change of scene. And I'd always thought that maybe a career in research might be something I'd be interested in. 
So I packed my bags and I drove over to Western Australia to do my honours in conservation biology. I used my newfound office skills to get in contact with the coordinators because I had no idea how this process was supposed to work. And I let them know, I was like, hey, my name's Verity. Um, I'm interested in conservation. I think feral predators are really interesting. Um, how do I go about this? And they gave me a list of people to contact. And that was when I first heard of Bush Heritage. They gave me the contact of the senior ecologist who works over here, Michelle. And so I sent Michelle an email and I said, hi, my name's Verity. I'm really interested in feral cats. Like this is my idea for a project. Um, would you be interested in supervising me? Because I'd read a bunch about Bush Heritage in that time from when I learned about them. And I was like, wow, this organization is doing exactly what I'd like to be doing. They are like doing all this amazing conservation work and they're working on projects that I find really interesting. And quietly in the back of my mind, I was like, if this honors goes well, I might be able to wrangle a job out of it. And Michelle gratefully said, yep, I'd love to supervise you. And so that was that I did my honors with, with Bush Heritage in conjuncture with the uni. Now, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. The honours was so hard. It is a massive piece of work. You are learning how to do scientific research from the ground up, how to find gaps in the literature, how to create a question, how to create a methodology to test that question. You need to learn how to do those methods because you've probably never done them before. You need to learn how to analyse this data. You've probably not done that before. You have to interpret those results and then write them up to a publication standard. It's a massive piece of work, but it is so, so beneficial. I think it's the best thing that I have done for my career. And you also get the opportunity to visit the these beautiful parts of the country. So these photos are all from Urati, which Sam, who you'll be talking to later, is um, the reserve manager for, and it's just glorious out there. To explain it or to elaborate on how beneficial it is, I think everybody who did the honours ended up getting work out of it, whether it was a research assistant position or PhD opportunities, or as for me, an internship. So when I finished my honours, Michelle let me know that Bush Heritage was looking for a field intern to help out with the upcoming monitoring season. So someone to help out there in the field, um, do the surveys, learn about how to do the surveys and just help generally the, the regional ecologist manage the workload. And my hand went up so quickly. Um, and so I spent three months in spring last year, basically shadowing the regional ecologist. And during that time, it was like dessert after a really hard meal. It was incredible. I got to help out with all the, the fauna trapping. So I learned all this, uh, the fauna handling skills, how to ID them, vegetation surveys, how to ID plants, how to manage data in a professional industry, how to manage volunteers. And also it was just such a great opportunity to meet and learn from so many knowledgeable and passionate people in conservation. If you get the opportunity or if you can find the opportunity, I think the internship is one of the most rewarding things that I've had the, the chance to, to be a part of. And gratefully, luckily, it was just a massive spoon of luck when my internship finished, like um, Michelle Stook was saying, the regional ecologist was going away on some extended leave. And so they tapped me on the shoulder and they said, hey, Verity, you're in a pretty good position here. You know the team. Would you like to stick around for a few more months and, and fill in while Ben's away? And like, I could not have said yes faster. It was such an incredible opportunity. And it's been a massive learning curve. This it's, it's a big role. You have a lot of responsibility and you want to do a really good job because, you know, you're trying to conserve the, this part of the country that is so special and important. But everyone has been so lovely and um, there's, they're, they're so willing to, to help you and, and to, to teach you. So now I'm finishing up my placement 
here and I'm looking forward to taking a little bit of time off actually. I'm going to actually go out and travel now that COVID has calmed down. And when I come back, next steps, well, if Bush will have me, <laughs> I would be grateful to return. But otherwise, I think um, looking towards consulting, as Ness was saying in her talk, to get some experience, more experience in the field, learn from um, other ecologists how they go about managing their reserves, how they go about research. I think there's a lot more space for me to learn and grow. And I'm really looking forward to sort of um, to having a little bit more time being mentored by some experienced people. So is that the end of time? It sure is. Beautiful. Thank no you worries. so much, Verity. That was uh, amazing. So where are we going to now, everyone? We've got a short five minute break. And what we're going to ask you to do is if you've got any questions that you'd like Vanessa or Verity to answer, please start putting them in the chat. So after our five minute break, we'll come back and we'll get to meet our next two speakers. So thank you. We'll see you back here very, very shortly.
Hello everyone and welcome back. Uh, thank you for those questions. Please keep them coming through. I hope there's uh, plenty of things you want to ask Vanessa and Verity. Now before we meet our next speaker, I just wanted to remind everyone if you've got any images that you're taking of the group out there, our hashtag for this morning is hashtag science superstars and you can tag us at Bush Heritage Oz. So uh, now let's meet our next presenter. But before we do, I just want to talk about collaboration. So it's absolutely key to a career in conservation. We collaborate with everybody, be it government, universities, schools, other not-for-profit organization. But very, very key to our work is corporate partners. So our next presenter, Dan Lim, is from our landscape corporate partner, Arab. And so the work that they do as part of their community engagement program is to provide their services in a pro bono capacity, which means they don't charge us. So some of the major works that Arab have been undertaking with Bush Heritage over the last few months is some major erosion and water control projects on our Hamlin Reserve in Western Australia, as well as our Nari Reserve in Northwest Australia. So we couldn't do all that we achieve without the support of our corporate partners. So let's meet Dan. I just want to tell you about Dan's journey. So he started his career. He's now the senior environmental consultant and he studied a Bachelor of Applied Science, Environmental Management and has a master's in science and geography. So let's meet Dan, thank you. Great, thanks very much. Cool, so hi everyone, I'm Dan. Uh, I'm a senior environmental consultant at Arup. So firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I present today. So on Melbourne, uh, that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. And I also acknowledge and respect the Wurundjeri peoples as knowledge holders of this country, understanding the history, culture, ecology, and stories of the region. And I recognize their invaluable contributions to environmental knowledge and protection. Great, so a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in Auckland, New Zealand, where I went to high school. Uh, and following that, I spent a year in Sweden. Uh, I went back to high school, uh, but I live with a family over there. So it was great experiencing a different culture. Um, I then went to the University of Otago, which is in the South Island of New Zealand, uh, in a town called Dunedin. And I studied my Bachelor of Applied Science and Master of Science there, which I'll talk about later. Uh, I then took a break. Um, I'd had a little bit of enough to do with studying things and I uh, went to Japan and I taught English for a couple of years, which was awesome. Uh, it was a great opportunity to get paid to live and work in another, another country and learn another language, so that was great. Um, I then decided I probably should start my career, so I moved to Melbourne uh, in 2014 and I started as an ecologist. And then in the last couple of years, I've moved across to Arab and I now work as an environmental consultant. Great. So why did I choose environmental science? Uh, growing up in New Zealand, even though I'm from Auckland, uh, my family are from Oakuni, which is in the central North Island. Uh, they're carrot farmers. And so I got to go down there a lot and spend a lot of time in New Zealand's sort of unique environment. I love learning about New Zealand's unique flora and fauna and things like that. Uh, every Sunday night, we also had David Anborough documentaries on TV, and I used to really look forward to watching those. And I think he really inspired me a love for the environment and wanting to learn more uh, and pursue a career in it. So then a little bit about Arup quickly. Um, so we're a multinational design and engineering firm. Uh, we're headquartered in London. Uh, we work in a lot of different spaces. So things like architecture, engineering, ecology, environmental science approvals, fire engineering. There's, there's all sorts of things. Economics, um, whatever you can think of, we probably do it. Uh, we've done a lot of really interesting work, so I wasn't aware of this until I joined Arup, but apparently we designed the Sydney Opera House, which was pretty interesting. Um, but then if you think about any large infrastructure project where you live, uh, so that's road or rail or whatever, we've probably been involved. Uh, so Arup has 33, they have offices in 33 countries around the world, there's 10 in Australia. Um, and I really like that because it gives us, we can do something called a long-term assignment, so that allows us to move to another country, and we can work there for two years or longer. Um, so it's a really good opportunity to move around and explore different countries or live in a different place and get different experiences. 
Um, we also work with a lot of charitable organizations such as Bush Heritage, um, as well as others like Red R, who send engineers and other professionals to developing countries or into disaster zones to help with humanitarian projects and things like that. So there's some pretty interesting opportunities at Arab. Um, so my career so far, as I said before, I started off as an ecologist, uh, like everybody else I think speaking today. So it was really great. I get to go out and look for threatened plants and animals. Uh, I map native vegetation uh, and I generally try to advise our clients on how to minimize or avoid their impacts on flora, native vegetation and fauna. Since then I've moved across to an environmental approvals role uh, where it's a little bit broader so I don't just deal with ecology, now it's dealing with a range of different disciplines like air quality, ecology, noise, uh, Aboriginal cultural heritage, European heritage, uh, all sorts of things. So it's really good working with a lot of different people. Um, and then my job now is to help clients sort of navigate different environmental laws in Victoria mainly, and but also across Australia. Uh, and I help them get approval from regulatory bodies, so that's like governments or councils and things like that, in order for their projects to proceed. And so why did I change from an ecologist to an environmental approvals consultant? Uh, it's not that I didn't enjoy ecology, it is a great job. I really like being out there in the field. Um, but I, because I'm still relatively early in my career, I wanted to get a broader range of experiences. So I wanted to work with a number of different disciplines, try to better understand how they all work um, in a consulting space rather than just focusing on ecology. Um, yeah, so that was just my personal preference. I wanted to widen my perspectives. Uh, some of the projects that I work on, if you're from Victoria or Melbourne specifically, you've probably heard of the level crossing removal project. So they're removing basically where road and rail connect. Uh, they're trying to separate them. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them across Melbourne. So that there's some big engineering and design projects. Uh, I also do a lot of work for major road projects Victoria, so lots of highway upgrades and things. And then on the screen uh, is Star of the South, which is the first, was one of the first offshore wind farms in Australia being developed. Uh, so my role on that project, I was an ecologist, uh, and we were looking at the transmission lines. So how do you get the power from the turbines offshore to the power grid? Uh, there were lots of different options that we were sort of, I was out there looking for threatened species, mapping vegetation, advising the client on where the least impact was, um, or as much as possible. Uh, and you can see the transmission line that's being proposed there on screen. Uh, great, so next slide, a couple of photos from my time uh, as an ecologist, because you don't get a lot of great photos when you work in the office. Uh, so on the top left is us staking out an acacia tree. This is in Hamilton in New Zealand. Um, so I was in Australia at the time, but I flew over to New Zealand to help them with this work. Uh, and we were looking for the New Zealand long-tailed bat, which is in the bottom left corner. Uh, they're like little soft brown pillows, they're really cute. Um, I also did some work looking for the growling grass frog, which is uh, the frog picture there. That's a threatened species in Australia. And then I also spent some time in South Australia doing some work for defence. Um, and happened to find a Sturt Desert Pea while I was out there, which is amazing. That's the floral emblem of South Australia. Just such a, such a beautiful flower. And great, how did I get here? Um, so at high school, we were allowed to choose our subjects from year 10 onwards, uh, and I generally focused on geography, biology, English, chemistry. Um, I really enjoyed geography, biology, and English. Uh, chemistry, not so much. I wasn't great at maths. Um, maths can be helpful, but it doesn't mean you have to be good at it in order to have a role in science and environmental consulting. So that's a good one for those uh, non-math nerds out there. I then went to the University of Otago, um, where I did my Bachelor of Applied Science. And that was a mix of physical geography and science uh, and business as well. Um, so geography, the geography degree gave me a really good grounding in physical sciences like geomorphology. So that's like landforms and things. Uh, ecology, soil science, coastal processes, and things like that. And then for my masters, uh, I I did some research. So I was looking at an invasive beach grass um, in Stewart Island at the bottom of New Zealand. So this picture here is Mason Bay on Stewart Island. Um, I mostly did the masters because I really wanted to spend some time down there. It's so beautiful. Uh, but the interesting thing we found was uh, we originally thought that the seeds from this invasive, invasive grass would last maybe five years in the sand, 
um, before they die uh, or become unviable or inviable. Um, but we found out that they could survive for over 21 years, uh, which has some pretty big implications for conservation. So yeah, that was really valuable. I got to learn how to run a research project. I learned how to write, I presented, I went to conferences. Uh, it was a really good experience. So I guess finally, some of the things that I've learned along the way, um, I think it's important to say yes. I mean, obviously you don't say yes to everything. You've got to think about your mental well-being, but say yes to as many opportunities as you can or as possible. I think it leads to some really great opportunities. Um, so for me, I said yes to going to Sweden for a year. Uh, I got to like, I lived in Japan and taught English for a couple of years. So that really like broadened my perspective. I learned other I learned other languages, I learned how other cultures operate, which is different to what we're used to in Australia and New Zealand. Um, it really helps actually in your work environment um, when you've got other, these other perspectives. Uh, in a work perspective, saying yes is also really important, particularly if you're a graduate. Um, it gives you the opportunity to work on lots of different things to really broaden your horizons, broaden your experience. Um, for me, as an as a example, uh, when I started as a graduate, um, I wanted to be a zoologist and there weren't actually that many opportunities in the zoology space, but there were opportunities in botany. So I just said yes. And to be honest, I think that actually accelerated my career. And it turns out I really love looking for orchids and threatened flora. It's, it's really fun. They also don't move, so they're a lot easier to find. <laughs> um, so yeah, saying yes whenever possible is great. I think networking doesn't have to be scary. Um, I know that you'll probably hear a lot that networking is super important, and it is, um, but it doesn't have to be scary. So I don't like the idea of going up to random people and talking to them, but when I talk to my mentees, so I'm a mentor, when I talk to my mentees, I advise them to look up people on LinkedIn who have job titles that they think they'd like to do, and then I get them to catch up for a coffee, but not not don't ask them about like can i get a job or how do i work in your company it's more what is your day-to-day -day role what are the challenges that you have in your role what do you like about the job that you do just trying to understand what they do um, and you never know things might come from that a lot of my best networking as well has come from where i volunteered so i volunteer for the environment institute of australia and new zealand um, and i do a lot of students in early career so work so i organize uh, events or professional development I help manage the mentoring program, um, things like that. And I find that uh, when you volunteer, you meet the same people a lot and there are people outside of work, and that can often lead to other opportunities as well. And then the final point I think is your career isn't set. I think a lot of people put pressure on themselves to know what they want to do straight, well, coming into uni or straight out of uni. Um, I don't think that's necessarily required. I think it's advantageous to know what you want to do, but um, I've heard it said before that over your working career, you may have up to 10 different jobs, maybe more, maybe less, it's up to you. Um, and I've seen it in the workplace. So for me, I was started as an ecologist. Well, I started as an English teacher, actually, and then I moved to ecology. And now I've gone across to environmental approvals. I'm thinking about working in sustainability. Um, I know people, well, my partner, she studied international development and now she's a brewer, so she makes beer. Um, I don't think your career is set and I don't think you should be scared about trying something that you think you enjoy and then maybe you don't. I think that's totally fine. Um, but yeah, I think that's everything from me. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Dan. And thank you for saying yes to being here today. That was uh, amazing and absolutely agree. Your career is never set. You never know what you are going to be led to. So thank you. Now, our final speaker for this morning is Sam Fisher. So Sam is joining us from our Urati Reserve in Western Australia. So Sam's been with us now for three years and he began his bush heritage journey as a field officer on our South Australian reserves, Bonbon bon and Balkamata, which are enormous. They're the biggest properties we have in our reserve network. So Sam is now the reserve manager for Urati in Western Australia, and he's completed a Bachelor of Science majoring in natural resource management with the University of Adelaide. So Sam's just going to give you a, a very different experience of what it means to um, to, to manage a property, to be on reserve all the time. Our other speakers that you've met, our ecologists, they come out 
do their assessment work and they uh, then head back in and undertake all their analysis where Sam lives, works, breathes on our remote property. So I'm just checking in. Is Sam, are you there? Yes, got you on screen. So thank you and over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, yeah, g'day everyone. Um, my name's Sam Fisher, as Michelle had said, and I uh, work for Bush Heritage Australia, and I'm here today to share a little bit about my pathway into a career in conservation. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the places in which we live and work and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, as Michelle had said, um, I'm calling in from Uradi Reserve, which is on Nanda Country in the Midwest region of Western Australia. So I work pretty closely with uh, Verity, who you've just heard from. Um, Uradi is 150 kilometres from the nearest major town, which is Geraldton, and it's where I live and work in my current role as Reserve Manager. So Uradi is one of the 42 reserves that's managed by Bush Heritage Australia. Uh, Uradi Reserve is a special place to live and work. It's on the northern end of the southwest botanical province, an area of floral biodiversity in Western Australia that's comparable to rainforests in terms of the plant species diversity. It's also pretty close to where Ness did a lot of her, her PhD and she also worked on Uradi earlier on in her Bush Heritage career. Um, there's been over 700 plant species recorded on Uradi to date. It projects many of the plant species found nowhere else in Australia. Uh, these include 25 species of orchids, uh, verticordias like the red and pink flowers you can see at the top of the screen here. Um, and come spring, there's fields of annual wildflowers underneath your young gum. Um, you can see again, here in this, this, this slide, slide um, some of the plants and animals that call your arty home, uh, including my favourite up in the top right there, the thorny devil which is cool on um, a fauna survey, I believe Verity was involved in. I think she had a photo of the same thorny devil. Unfortunately, prior to uh, Bush Heritage Australia purchasing Urati, uh, part of it, about one tenth, was cleared for agriculture. Um, after natural regeneration failed to occur, we have uh, partnered with Carbon Positive Australia uh, to undertake an ambitious revegetation project, which aims to plant over a million trees across parts of the reserve that have been cleared. Um, this project's in its fifth year. And as you can see from these before and after drone photos, we're making some good, really good progress on the red soils. Um, this project also aims to better understand some of the barriers and knowledge gaps around restoration. Uh, we get to work with universities and researchers to undertake projects on the reserve and ensures that our restoration has the best outcomes for the plants and animals that live in it and use it. So it's a little bit about the reserve that I manage, Urati. Um, you guys might be wondering, what on earth does a reserve manager do, aside from taking photos of plants and, and looking for reptiles? So as Michelle made mention, I, I do the on-ground conservation work, um, which pretty much boils down to protecting the things in the environment that we care about through managing the things that threaten them. So some of the things that threaten the environment on Urati include feral cats, foxes, rabbits, weeds, and wildfires. Um, I use a variety of methods like spraying for weeds, creating fire breaks to minimize wildfires, and trapping for cats and foxes on the reserve. I also work with our team of ecologists like Verity and Ness uh, to monitor on reserve to see if the management actions I undertake are actually having an impact. On Urati, we do things like fawn trapping surveys, use remote cameras, uh, look at tracks in the sand and many other methods to understand how our flora and fauna responds to management. That's not all. Um, I work with many other groups, including our volunteers, traditional owners, the community, national parks and researchers to undertake projects here on the reserve, uh, have people out and out spending time on country and help people understand that the work, uh, sorry, to understand the work that goes on out here. And lastly, uh, I make sure that the reserve is in a safe and comfortable working condition and it's a, it's a good spot to live and work. So I'm, I'm responsible for keeping the buildings and vehicles in good condition, 
uh, making sure there's power and water to the place and that the workplace is safe. So I guess you could say I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. So how on earth did I end up here? It seems to be a bit of a recurring theme in these talks, but uh, I grew up in regional South Australia and loved being out in the bush. Uh, my grandparents had a farm in the Flinders Ranges. Um, I loved being out there, but I didn't necessarily like working with sheep. Um, I found that I much preferred being down the river red gum line banks, uh, building cubby houses as Verity liked to do as well, and uh, looking for old bottles in the ruins. I loved science as a kid. Um, but I wanted to be a paleontologist or an archaeologist. I liked movies like Indiana Jones and Jurassic Park. And I, um, I wanted to do something like that, but I didn't think there was a career in Australia that I could do something like that. Um, I thought a job in the bush sort of meant working on the farm or being a ranger for national parks. I didn't realise there were so many avenues or in careers for conservation. Um, so I went to high school and I graduated with pretty good grades. I uh, studied English, history, biology and chemistry. Um, I loved school and I wanted to continue studying so I picked, picked a Bachelor of Science, um, majoring in eco-chemistry as my degree. Um, I also went to a boarding college which was a great opportunity to make plenty of good friends in Adelaide. I'd never lived in the city before so it was a big change for me. Um, one lesson I learned pretty early on was that I realised that chemistry wasn't my specialty and, and I failed horrifically in my first year of my chemistry degree, uh, chemistry classes, sorry. Um, that was really hard for me because up until then I I'd enjoyed, enjoyed it as a subject. I'd got pretty good grades at school and, uh, and uh, it sort of gave me an opportunity to rethink where I was going um, with my new degree. So I, I changed it, I changed it at the end of my first year. Um, changed my major to natural resource management. Um, I, I realised after my first year that I enjoyed working, um, learning about ecosystem processes. Um, I liked being able to work in an environment where I could see things with my own two eyes and actually hear it with my ears. So, so I found that really rewarding in the biology subjects that I undertook, um, which, uh, which uh, had, had quite a, a conservation and ecological focus. So, so I changed. And, uh, I got to do more classes in soil science, uh, botany, climate change and things like that. And I really hit my stride, I really enjoyed it. Um, whilst I learned a lot during my three years at uni, um, some things that I didn't do that I kind of regret, I didn't join any clubs, I didn't do any volunteering, I didn't really network much amongst the, my, um, my peers. Um, I just presumed that once I got my degree that I'd go straight to the national parks, get a job as a ranger, you know, it'd be, I'd be right. That was, uh, that was my path forward. I was wrong. <laughs> um, so I left university, I moved back home to regional South Australia. Um, at that time, pathways into conservation were hard to come by. And uh, I began working in tourism and visitor information in, in the Flinders Ranges National Park. Parks went hiring ranges and I didn't know where else to go with my degree. Um, I was really lucky though that uh, the Flinders Ranges National Park had an ambitious reintroduction project starting up just as I sort of started in my work there. They were reintroducing a locally extinct species, uh, Inya, which is the Western quoll. You can actually see a baby one in my hands in the top right there. Um, it was really special um, being able to uh, work on that project. I, I just started talking to the researchers that were out there and, uh, and then started volunteering on my days off. And I, I really quickly realised that um, it was important to just just to talk to fellow conservationists. Um, it opened up so many doors for me. I, um, I started volunteering across South Australia. Um, I sort of would work at home for a few months, then pack up my car and then go for a drive. And I yeah, traveled all around. I went to Arid Recovery, a fence preserve in South Australia. I did surveys in the Gold Ranges National Park. Um, I didn't mean to one up you there, Dan, but I saw fields of uh, sturt desert peas in some of the places where I've gone. So um, yeah, it was a very rewarding time getting out and um, learning a lot about the environment. Yeah, for me, there were many, many really good benefits for volunteering. Um, early on, I got a lot of hands-on experience undertaking research projects. 
learned a lot about monitoring techniques like remote camera deployment and uh, pitfall trapping, land management activities like seed collection, and just living and working in the bush, it was really valuable. Um, it allowed me to work out what areas of conservation that I wanted to focus on. Uh, many of the people that I met through volunteering have become friends and good work colleagues. And I still volunteer even today, and now that I've got a full-time job. Um, volunteering can be done at any stage of your career, even while you're still in school. Um, yeah, I volunteered with university researchers and uh, conservation organisations like Australian Wildlife Conservancy and Bush Heritage Australia. So I like Verity, I've also done uh, an internship. I've actually done three. <laughs> um, so the internships that I did were with Arid Recovery in South Australia, Conservation Ecology Centre, which is in uh, near Apollo Bay in Victoria, Western Melbourne, and uh, Australian Wildlife Conservancy, who operate all across the country. But I did my internship with them at Mornington in the Kimberley. And these photos here are all from my internship uh, in the Kimberley with Australian Wildlife Conservancy. Uh, internships were really good for me to understand how conservation organisations worked, how, how they're monitoring, the reporting and, and the sharing of information is just as important as doing the actual on-ground work and how to work well as a team. Um, and especially in remote places, uh, this internship at Mornington in the Kimberley was eight hours from the nearest town. Um, so you had to really learn to work well with your peers. Um, and these photos, yeah, as I said, are all from that internship. Finally, after a few years of a mix of volunteering, internships and casual work, which included consultancy as, a, as a many of our other presenters have already done, um, I landed a full-time job with Bush Heritage Australia on their South Australian reserves, as, as Michelle had made, made mention, uh, which are Bonbon bon and Bulkamata. So Bush Heritage have been really good in supporting me in building my skills to become the manager of one of the reserves um, through training and through mentorship from some excellent conservationists. Uh, they've also been really supportive of my love of travel and seeing a new country, which has meant that I've lived on three different reserves and worked across many more. So yeah, I think this is a bit of a recurring theme uh, amongst our presenters today. Conservation can take your places. Um, it was a, an appeal for me in a, as a career in con conservation was that I could explore Australia. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work across three different states so far in my career and across environments ranging from like snowy alpine areas of the Victorian high country, tropical rainforest pockets in the Kimberley, uh, arid rangelands in South Australia, and here now in a floral biodiversity hotspot at Urati. So, um, uh, it's pretty special the, uh, how lucky I am. It's not, not lost on me. It's amazing to be able to live and work in these sorts of places. So I thought I'd uh, leave you with a few bits of advice. If you uh, think this sounds like a good, good opportunity for you and you want to pursue a career in conservation, um, here's a few tips. Whilst I understand most of you guys are studying science subjects, at least some of them, um, not all conservationists have science backgrounds. And in fact, many great ones that I've worked with haven't even studied science. They were just curious about the natural environment. So listen to people from all backgrounds. Some farmers and traditional learners understand the land far better than you can ever learn in school or uni. In a similar vein, conservation is highly collaborative. Don't be afraid to be flexible in finding your dream job in conservation immediately. Some things you might find you don't like, that's okay. Volunteering can be a good way to find out where you want to go on conservation. Um, it allows you to explore many other many avenues. So I really encourage you, if you can, to do a little bit. Um, the conservation industry is really small um, and it's filled with passionate people. So talk to them. Many conservationists will want to share the work that they do. You never know what opportunities come up from just a chat. And lastly, follow your passion. If you love the environment, help protect it. If a job like mine, actually living and working out in the bush isn't for you, it's fine. There are ways to support conservation. Thanks once again for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you all today. Take care, all the best.
Thank you, Sam. That was awesome. And uh, just for everybody's knowledge out there, the first minute or so, the sound was a little bit dodgy. So we'll clean that up in post-production. So when you get a copy of the recording, Sam's uh, voice for those first little seconds will be fine. Now we're running a smidge over time. So we're not going to worry about our second break because you've still got the ability to pop all your questions through. So there's some good ones coming through. So thank you everyone. And I'll keep checking. But this first question is actually for you, Sam. So what kind of conditions do you live in on a reserve? <coughs> Oh, thanks. Um, just a sec. I'm just uh, getting my screen set up. If you bear with me. There we go. That's a bit better. Um, so I have lived in all sorts of conditions, uh, depending on where, where, uh, which reserve that I've been on. Um, here at the moment, as a reserve manager, I'm I'm very lucky. I live in a <coughs> bedroom house. It's it's a uh, very comfortable. It can be hot in summer, and uh, it's not too cold in winter part of the world, but uh, I'm very, very well set up. But um, it depends on how adventurous you are. Um, in some places I've lived in, a, lived in a tent for weeks on end while I've been doing form surveys. The places I've traveled um, as a consultant, um, living, living in Airbnbs and hotel rooms, but, um, but uh, as, a, as a reserve manager or being reserve based in a role like which Heritage has provided me, um, you generally get a comfortable house, um, reasonably good internet, it seems, and, uh, and uh, yeah, access to a lot of really good books. Awesome. And I've been to your reserve and it's absolutely gorgeous out there, especially in the wildflower season, which uh, I think is around August, September. So wonderful opportunity. Now this one, I think maybe Ness. So what are the main differences between the jobs in ecology and biology? Ooh, they, they can cross over a lot, I think. Um, yeah, ecology is really looking at how plants and animals interact with the environment they live in. So there's an understanding of, it's got that breadth where you can understand the soils and the weather and the habitat that the plants provide for the animals. It's bringing all those things together. Um, and biology, in my mind, is a bit more... Um, it can be talking about how an animal, the in, internal workings of an animal, like, you know, its anatomy or that kind of thing. Or you could be talking about how plants absorb sunlight or it, it gets a little bit more specific and a little bit more focused on a particular plant or animal or aspect of our natural world, if that helps. Um, that's, that's in my mind anyway. But they can be a lot of overlap. So. Hmm. Brilliant. Thank you. Now, the next questions are for me. So uh, a couple of questions here before looking after our students and interns, I looked after our volunteer program. So I think absolutely every one of our presenters today talked about the importance of volunteering. Now, in uh, when we finish today, we're going to send your teachers an email and we'll give you some links to some organisations that will be able to help you. So whilst you're under 18, um, it, it's probably not as many opportunities as once you're, you know, you're licensed and you can get out there on country yourself. So land care are fantastic. They have local opportunities uh, and also go volunteer and seek volunteers that always got amazing opportunities available. So we'll send you those in our post follow up email. Our internships. Now we are very passionate that all of our internships are paid and they are paid at the standard wage for all of our <laughs> staff receive. So generally what we're pitching those internships toward are people that have already finished school and they may have um, just completed their studies, be that through a uh, university if they're looking to get into ecology or we've just launched a reserve manager traineeship, uh, sorry, internship. And that can be for anyone that's undertaking even a cert for in environmental um, studies. So through the TAFE network. So as you can uh, see from the presentation by Sam, if you're a reserve manager, as he said, you've got to be jack of all trades. So a lot of our reserve managers have come through, um, they might have been tradies, they may have been in the army for a long time, they may have, um, you know, worked in a completely different field and but always had that passion for the environment. So generally, it's people that have finished their 
their study. So I hope that answers your questions, but uh, we'll have all that information in our follow-up email. Now, this one here is for um, Verity. So you talked about needing to learn animal handling skills. What type of skills? Those lizards look spiky. Do you wear gloves? The gecko seem to have delicate skin. So how do you avoid harming other reptiles? Um, well, you're gentle to start with. Um, so some of the species, so uh, we've had goannas in the <coughs> traps before. And so you're definitely wearing like sort of welding gloves for that because those guys have big spiky claws and you don't want them in you. Um, and then, I mean, don't take this and go out and start catching animals, but <laughs> it's, it's a lot of being gentle and also um, trying to cover their eyes um, so that they're not as stressed and um, not picking them up by the tail because a lot of skinks can, can drop their tails um, and you don't want to cause them any, any harm. And yeah, just sort of going with a, a, a gentle approach because at the end of the day, like you, you're there to help conserve the animals. Like you, one data management uh, measurement is not as important as, you know, making sure that the animal gets out, you know, safe. So gentle gloves for ones with, you know, big scary spikes and um, cover their eyes so they don't stress too much. So this next one's for both you, Verity, and Vanessa. So we might go to you first, Verity. Um, the audience would like to know, how long did you study for to achieve your qualifications? So to you first, Verity. Yeah, sure. So I, I did a double bachelor's in my undergrad. So that was supposed to be four years, but I took five because I took a little bit of time off. And then the honours was one year. So I've been studying for a total of six. Beautiful. Ness, what about you? You did the big PhD, so. Yeah, so I did four years of my bachelor and then the year of honours and then four years of the PhD. Not all in one row, though. As I said, I travelled and things in between, but nine years-ish of, of university, but I loved it. And I, yeah, I, um, you know, did little things along the way that made it take a little bit longer So because I was just loving it. And then would you say one of the questions here for you, Vanessa, is do you have to have a doctorate in order to be an ecologist? No, no. As Sam said, no, you, you do absolutely do not. You can learn about the bush and look after the bush and be an ecologist, you know, with, through lots of different pathways. And as Sam mentioned, you know, traditional owners are looking after the bush there got their own knowledge about how animals and plants live together and how to look after the bush and what healthy bush looks like. And that, you know, they might not have done any sort of university. So absolutely not. Um, but I would say that uh, having a PhD has helped me get opportunities that I might not have got otherwise. Uh, yeah, but it's also quite academic and um, that may not be the pathway you want to take. So you might not. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, absolutely not. You don't have to do it. At all. Dan, this one is for you. So um, you're part of a, a massive, big international organisation. So the question is, is travel a big aspect of ecology and are there many environmental roles that don't involve travelling? Uh, hmm, good question. Um, I think if you do end up being an ecologist, particularly in, con uh, in consulting, you will travel a lot possibly just within your state. Um, so for me, uh, I spend a lot of, well, when I was an ecologist, I did spend quite a bit of time away from home or overnights or week long trips and things like that. Um, you don't have to though. There are people in our ecology team that, that don't, they have families or things like that. So they tend to just do surveys around Melbourne or, or wherever they're based. So I think in large, in large companies like, like Arup, uh, you can kind of work flexibly. So if you're able to go away for a long period of time, then that's great. And if you can't, then you generally will work around. It. So yeah, you don't have to travel or you can if you want. I think there's many options. Thank you. And now this one's for you, Sam. So before formally studying, were you interested in any specific group of um, species, like birds, snakes, reptiles? What, what floated your boat? 
Um, I think there was, a, there was a photo in my presentation earlier on and uh, my first volunteering experience, my first like exposure to to uh, working with animals was uh, catching southern hairy nosed wombats on uh, agricultural lands, little pockets left of uh, Mallee in agricultural lands in South Australia. Um, so, so mammals really, really kicked off my career in conservation. Um, I worked closely with the Western Quarrel on the Western Quarrel Reintroduction Project and then in turning out a place like Arid Recovery, that's a fence reserve that has threatened species reintroduced back into it, um, was, was really good at getting some literal hands-on experience with those animals. Um, I've since learned that uh, being, I think being a uh, good conservationist means that you're interested in everything. Um, I've, I live in a plant biodiversity hotspot now, so I'm very interested in plants. Uh, when I worked in the Kimberley, I did I did bird watching tours. So so I've learned that everything's very interesting and very valuable. And if you uh, if you approach a career in conservation with that mindset, you're never going to be bored. Um, everywhere you go, there's something new and exciting to look at. I know when we all travel, it's very hard to get anywhere quickly because we're all like this, no matter what's happening, looking out the window and seeing what species we can find. So it's always a very slow trip. Sam, this is actually another question for you. So um, the audience out there would like to know for your particular role as a reserve manager, um, do you think university was essential or could you have taken a path undertaking a TAFE course in natural resource management? Oh, definitely, definitely not essential. Um, I think I think it really has helped me though in being able to work and collaborate closely with the ecologists and researchers. Um, I sort of understand a bit more of that monitoring process, um, which I think they find really valuable. It allows me to participate a little bit more in the um, in the ecology space. But as a as a, well, I think everyone sort of said some of the best conservationists aren't necessarily university trained um, and many reserve managers within our organisation um, are <coughs> university trained. They've just had a, um, a yeah, wide ranging careers. They could have worked on pastoral stations, but really like conservation. Um, as, as you had said, Michelle, some, some have army careers. So uh, yeah, there is no set path into being a reserve manager. You just got to be good at living in the bush. You got to sometimes enjoy your own company and uh, and take a positive and practical approach to everything that you do because you'll do something different every day and uh, you won't always know how to fix it. So yeah, taking a positive approach to it all is uh, key, I think. Thanks, Sam. And another couple of questions for me here. How long does an internship go for? So we offer either three month full-time internships or six month part-time internships. And as mentioned, um, they're fully paid. I know uh, not, not all internships are paid, but it's something that we hang out hat on and um, our interns, they're staff members. So they complete all the training that our staff um, complete. They have access to all the support systems that our staff do. And we also offer um, mentoring. So part of the Seeding Future program, we have two mentors and they work with you week on week about absolutely any Anything and everything just to get you job ready. So we started the program in September last year. We've only put eight interns through so far. And of all those eight interns, absolutely every single one of them has got a uh, full-time employment, be that with Bush Heritage or one of our uh, sister organisations. Another question is around what sort of salary an ecologist can expect. It really depends um, if you're going into the corporate space, the government sector or the not-for-profit sector and it really depends on your level of experience. So entry point um, is pretty much the same across the board, but as you increase with your experience and the kind of work you're doing, that can change. But um, you, can, you know, the, I think there's something called salary survey online and you can put what sort of uh, career you want and that'll give you an indication. I think SEEK might offer that service. So that, that's probably gonna give you a, a really good indication. Now, a question for everybody, I'll go around the room. So we'll start with you first, Dan. Uh, let me go back here. Um, oh no, we've had that one. It was basically asking 
What's the, the biggest difficulty? What's the hardest thing that you found um, working in this space? So Dan, what was, sorry to put you on the spot there. <laughs> biggest challenge you face uh, in this career? Yeah. Um, one thing that I do struggle with is that, you know, I love the environment. I got into this industry to protect it. Um, and you're, when you're a consultant, you are limited by the legislation that's in place. Uh, and so sometimes it feels like I'm basically just rubber stamping destruction of native vegetation and things. Um, so that's a challenge, but I think the best way to approach that is that, um, you know, like Vanessa alluded to before, you don't, you don't ever um, reduce your standards based on what a developer wants or anything. You tell them exactly what's there, you tell them what's required, and then you also advocate for the environment. So how do you protect it? How can you reduce their impact as much as possible? I think, yeah. Thank you. And when we work in conservation, we remain flexible all the time. And that's happening right now because I've just looked at our clock and we've only got a, a couple more minutes left. But um, to finish up, I just want to know what's been your greatest achievement? So, Vanessa, you've been in this space for um, probably longer than the others. So what's your greatest achievement been? I think it was surprising or working with Madhu on the Burlibur Indigenous Protected Area to develop their Bush Tucker book. It's about to be launched later this year. And I think uh, bringing all that information together and, and learning about the incredible knowledge, there's hundreds of species that they know about and, and bringing all that together has been really powerful and um, something they can pass on to their the younger generation to keep all that knowledge alive. So. Awesome. Now we've got time for one more comment. Who would like to um, tell us their greatest achievement so far in their career? Any takers of the three other presenters? Come on, Sam, I'm looking at you. What, what's oh, been yeah. your greatest achievement? Verity's got her hand up, let her go. Well, now, I feel, now I feel awkward. I, they they want me. <laughs> Well, I was going to be super selfish and say that the honours was the greatest achievement because it is such a, a massive piece of work and it's done so much um, to benefit, you know, like the career and all that. So I was going to say that was a pretty, pretty proud achievement there. Absolutely. And I think that's something that you've all said today that, yeah, we, we get all these amazing experiences, meeting other people, getting out on country, but sometimes it's tough and resilience. We all need that no matter who we are, what we're doing at what stage of life, just knowing that you fall down, you get back up again. So um, that's definitely, and there's always in this space, somebody there to help you get back up. So um, I think we're just about at time. I want to thank you all for joining us today. It's been amazing. Now, as mentioned a little bit earlier, where we go to from here is you're after um, this presentation, your teachers are going to receive an email. Now, in that email is a survey. We're scientists, we like to, to measure everything. And what we wanna do is just get your feedback on the structure of today. Was it beneficial, how we could change? Because this is actually something we wanna do um, every single year to help as many young people as possible define where they wanna go in their career. Now that email will also have a lot of links, um, different information that we've talked about today. Um, there's the volunteer information, where to find out more about a, a career in um, at the environmental space or conservation so that's coming through very very shortly I want to thank you all so thank you for um, joining us today thank you to your teachers your course coordinators your caregivers please from here uh, go and talk to those people go and ask what I need to do to start making these steps into a career in conservation what I need to study so Though they're there to help you and guide you through where you need to go. A massive thank you to our presenters. So Vanessa, Verity, Dan and Sam, we know how busy you are, but we also know how passionate you are about helping young people to define how they want to spend their career. 
Now, just to finish off, one career that we haven't spoken about within our sector is event management. So today, this entire concept was put together by our amazing Megan Pritchard, who is our events manager. So thank you, Megan. And I know you are just as passionate as the rest of us to help young people and understand that this is just the first step. Our careers last a really long time. So we want you to have fun and we hope we see you in the future working with Bush Heritage. Thank you, everyone.